What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg. Today I'm joined with Nicole Pendergrass. How are you doing today, Nicole? Hey, Dan. I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me on. I'm excited to, to chat. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I really enjoy these little chats as well. And for you in the audience who uh, maybe you're not uh, that familiar with uh, the, this series of chance encounters, but what I do is I interview commercial real estate investors. I find out what is their motivation for their next deal so that we can figure out how that fits into our business. And then we go through the six different roles that somebody typically takes in taking down, operating, or flipping a commercial property. And I say, which one is you? So, uh, but one thing I wanna do first though, cause I think that if you're going to have any level of success uh, in life, one of the most important things you have to be able to do is to effectively introduce yourself. So Nicole, could you please introduce yourself for the audience? Well, no pressure there, Dan, <laughs> but <laughs> so hopefully this is effective, but I am Nicole Pendergrass. I'm a multifamily real estate investor. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a child of God. I am an optimist. And right now I am working on building wealth for myself and my community and others who were not privy to that type of information and wealth building strategies um, historically. And that's my mission. Excellent, excellent, and, it, and it's, it's why we get along so well. So uh, first, I'll uh, I'll bring up the motivation. I found a lot of beginners. They they wouldn't know the role that they'd probably play in the next commercial deal, but they definitely know the motivation. So that's why I like to start off with these questions. I've got the roles uh, listed down there, but you don't need to read that because uh, that's clearer on the die. So the first motivation I found that some people have for wanting to pick up a commercial property is because they're looking to preserve their purchasing power. So in general, that'd be, you know, like your family offices, the people who make their wealth pay for their day to day. And, and so the big uh, pain point for them is they're concerned about inflation, basically stopping the party, uh, which is uh, it's, it's a distinct possibility with the uh, rate that we've been printing money uh, at you know, over the last uh, two years. But uh, so preserving purchasing power is the first one. The second one is the one that best describes my situation. So my background is in e-commerce technology and mass marketing. Uh, so that means I'm doing lead generation, lead capture and online sales funnels. Now that is a high paying job and career, but the problem with that is if you want to accumulate wealth, then you're gonna to have to have an intermediate step of paying income tax. So it occurred to me, hey, well, why don't I just Put my effort directly into being in the GP team so that way I'm being rewarded for my effort in the form of wealth instead of income. Which brings me to the next reason. This is the most common reason that people want to get involved in commercial real estate. It's that they want to fast track with their retirement. And the important things that I want to add about that is that it's implied that there's, there's an end point in mind okay so in other words uh you know maybe they just want to become an accredited investor you know get that level of wealth and then just basically retire and take it easy but that's in stark contrast to the next group who they're just super ambitious they want to buy their entire hometown okay they need to have the skyscra skyscraper with their name on it you know uh, they have to have the biggest yacht in the pier and uh you know that's great for for people in this industry because we know that they're not just going to call it quits once they get a, uh, a nice nest egg. And that brings me to the last one where it's not 100% about profits at all. It's that there's some sort of sector of society that they want to uh, uh, help and they realize that building your wealth is one of the best vehicles you can have. After all, you know, it's like you can really help your community as being a librarian, but it's very rare to have a hospital 
named after a librarian. So it makes sense to find some other uh, way to accumulate that wealth so you can give back to that sector of society or some people are saying animals and things like that. So of those five motivations, Nicole, uh, which combination of those or, or uh, what really resonates or describes you the best? Okay, I'm glad you said I could choose a combination because I really was already thinking that I'm a mashup of numbers three through five. Mm -hmm. So I do want to fast track my retirement, but I definitely don't want to just be sitting around the house doing nothing. Like there's no end point for me. I also debate with myself of how overly ambitious am I really? Um, I'm a type personality in some things and then other things I really couldn't give two craps about. So I'm somewhere in the middle and I don't know once I become accredited and I'm investing my money in other assets and just getting truly passive income coming in, what will I be doing? Will I still be trying to build the empire bigger? Or I know I definitely will be helping those underserved and underprivileged to build wealth and try to close that wealth gap, the racial wealth gap. That's a big passion of mine. So I know I'll still be working on that goal, but I don't know in what capacity that will be. Will I be trying to develop ground up and give that to, or um, house, you know, low income tenants and maybe have investors be from minority populations to build their wealth on the buy side and improve, improve communities on the living side. Um, it's something I've toyed with, but how big that gets, I can make that as big or as small as I want to. So it just depends when I get to that point, um, what that continues to look like. Right now, I'm, I'm the overly ambitious type because I have to work to build up that wealth and um, equity like you were mentioning. Um, also, you know, I guess avoiding income taxes and not having caps on my passive loss limitations would be really nice. And that's something that I'm working on now, like other strategies for that. Because even though I'm investing in real estate and I get a lot of write-offs, like I'm hitting those limitations because I still have a W-2 and I can't be an officially um, professional real estate uh, person. So um, yeah, that, that's really where I'm at right now. And I think I'm a combination of quite a few of them, but I would say three through five. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you don't have people picking just one. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's rare. Uh, like I've had it where somebody runs a family office and they were solidly on the preserve purchasing power. Uh, well, uh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I right. Hope to yeah. transition to that bucket. So, you yeah. know, sooner rather than later. Yeah, and it's it's quite the eye opener about it's like, okay, so what exactly is your lifestyle like when, you know, like all of your income is depending on like $425 million worth of assets and the cash flow that it, it, it produces. It, it's really an intensive, uh, you know, situation. But I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you, you pointed out the combination that you did. Because one thing that keeps on going through my head uh, because of my digital background is uh, there was that book by Tim Ferriss, Four Hour Work Week that came out. And so everybody was trying to get into the digital space where I was the person who was enabling people to have four hour work weeks. So, it was, and my work week was not four hours uh, to, to, to make that happen. And um, uh, so, so if you take that as an idea, I just want to throw that out there before we get to the next segment is uh, if you take that as an ideal, you know, a commercial property at the end of the day, it's still a business. It's a, it's a piece of land with a business attached to it. And um, if, if you are running it well, like let's just use that as a standard, you know, four hour work week, that really only means you have about 10 properties. Like if you can actually keep them down to only four hours a week, you know, after 10 properties, it's like, well, you're, you're done. You're already, you're, your 40 hours are accounted for. So how are you actually gonna, um, you know, continue that on? And I think that that's the, the limit to people's ambition, uh, even if they don't realize it. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, of course, that's just enough the cough, a cuff, uh, uh, remark. So, you know, I, I don't know if there's much to say about that at all, but. Uh, no, I mean, it, it makes sense. Um, and I think I read the four hour work week and a lot of what he said did make sense. Um, but it, it, it does take some work to set all those systems up so that you have more time and people are respecting your time because you have boundaries and you stick to them and you put all these softwares or whatever you're using and how they work together and all the systems um i think he put so many um 
like strategies and links and uh, ways that you can apply it, but it can get overwhelming because there, there is so much to dig into and you have to kind of knit, knit at it or pick at it like one piece at a time and just, you know, slowly start implementing. But I know I tend to read things like that and want to get the whole thing done at one time. Like, you know, can I spend one week and just do everything or like one day, but, you know, building over time is kind of frustrating for me because I like to see finished product. So how, as fast as I can get to that finished product, it's like, okay, I did this, this, and this, all right, now we're done, you know, and I need to implement a little bit more patience when it comes to creating those life systems because you can create and design your life. And I'm really going digging deeper into the whole life by design type of situation and really thinking, what do you want to be doing? Where do you want to be living? How much time do you want to be working? And what can you do now to create that lifestyle? So mm-hmm. it has to be very purposeful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so let's get uh, further into the business side of the, of the buildings then. And I'll do that through uh, using the die here, the Dan does deal die. So first I'll talk about what a repositioner is because that's one of the core competencies that I have. So you see that there are pictures of multiple different properties, lots of paper. And uh, that means that part of what the repositioner is responsible to do is because they're acquisitions, they're looking at a whole whack of different properties and they're trying to find out which ones actually have some upside that, uh, that we can squeeze out of it. And one of the most obvious ways to find that upside is through more efficient operations. Uh, that also means, you know, monitoring your expense ratio, your expenses. So like I got the money going down the toilet because, you know, like wastewater is a great example of something that actually makes a huge difference to the end up uh, the, the actual valuation of the property. But there's also things like marketing, you know, that have to do with the money there. Uh, so that's to make sure that your vacancy rate is really, really low and uh, all those kinds of, uh, uh, you know, maintenance measures. But anyway, so that's operations for you. And but right now we're in the hottest real estate market in history so more efficient operations it's not really going to cut it more often than not so you have to find a contractor team to fix the place up make it nicer and then that way you can charge more in rent so uh the problem with having your contractor and operations if i'm the repositioner is i'm from the internet which means i'm not flying there every single time there's a problem (laughs) so you need to have a local you have to have boots on the ground somebody who can check and make sure that the operations people aren't just spoofing the photos that they're sending that the that the property is actually in good shape and also making sure that the contractor doesn't cut any corners So that's more or less the day-to-day team that's uh, responsible for everything day-to-day. But in the actual transaction, you're going to have to go to a financier, in other words, a bank, and say, hey, this uh, property, I want to buy it, and it costs like $20 million. So can I borrow like $20 million uh, is what you say to the financier, and they'll say, okay, so here's your group, here's your property, okay, how about that, but uh, who's your sponsor? And if you're a beginner, you'll be like, who's your what and who now? And um, the sponsor is someone who already owns a similar asset and uh, you have to have somebody on the team. If you want to get a loan, you have to have somebody on the team who already owns a similar asset. And then you also have to have a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. So those are the six different roles there. And I go through them in these interviews to say, what's your core competency? What part would you be bringing to your next commercial deal? Uh, also keep it in mind, uh, financier, the, the one part that's not so clear is that a capital raiser is a form of a financier. So uh, which of these is your core competency or what you're most likely to contribute in your next uh, commercial deal, Nicole? Oh, I'm definitely the sponsor, KP. Mm-hmm. That's me. No, mm-hmm. no, it's not, it's not at all. <laughs> one day, one day I'll be the sponsor, KP. Soon. But I am the repositioner operations person. So that's, you know, that's the strategy I look for. I'm always looking for value add opportunities, which is like the hot thing right now. But like you said, it's very hard to find because the market is so hot. Um, You really have to put in some strategies with acquisitions. So you have to have a strong acquisitions team to go direct to the seller, maybe be off market or from off market with brokers and really establish that relationship with them so that they're sending you deals directly from the seller that are not on the market yet. So in this market, you definitely have to have strong acquisitions in order to even implement a repositioning strategy, because then otherwise you won't find those deals. Everyone is doing deals and repositioning and squeezing out all the value. So the next end buyer is just buying for the, the cash flow and not for any type of built-in equity. So right now, yes, I am the repositioner. I'm actually repositioning 
um, a smaller unit right now, and we are nearing the end of that. We have one more one unit that's finished that needs to get rented out, and then one more unit that needs to get turned, which is rehabbed and made pretty. And then we'll be able to refinance and pull back out that equity, which is the whole point of the repositioning strategy, because you can get your money back and still own the building and have it cash flow. So excellent, great strategy. Excellent. And so uh, the, the next question I usually have for uh, my guests is the buy box. So are there are there any attributes of a property where it's just a slam dunk for you? It's just way easier for you to make the decision to say it's like, OK, yeah, I'll 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 put this in my portfolio. So I'm asking about uh, geographic areas and unit counts, uh, you know, an asset type, you know, that sort of thing. So so what uh, what are you looking for more than any other other type of property, Nicole? So I'm really looking for, uh, my market is Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, and then also the 30 to 100 unit range, B and C class workforce housing, multifamily properties, where there is some type of, preferably the ideal property would be where it's just a management play. And there's no heavy reposition, like no heavy rehab and updating is needed. There's no CapEx and all that. I mean, that would be, I mean, if there, most of them do, like especially older buildings, because Southeast Pennsylvania has a lot of older buildings. Um, but yes, I would love to just have a management play. Rents are like a couple hundred dollars below market because now that's easy because market rents are increasing so quickly, you know, that by time, you know, someone's in lease a few months after their lease starts, you know, rents are already, you know, way higher. So that would be that the rent below rent would be below market rent would be easy to find. But one where it's just a management play, like they're not being efficient with how they're keeping track of expenses. There's other ways to decrease expenses that they're not doing. They can increase rents without having to kind of actually put in a lot of heavy construction into the property. Um, if it's if it's light construction, yeah, that's that's great too. But I would definitely love to have a deal that's um, that's just a management play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So uh, you get bonus points for referring to one of the sides of the die on this next question. But uh, I find that uh, one of the best things I can ask my guests is who in real estate is the person where you personally can help them more than any other type of person. Okay. I have to warn that you, you can't, uh, you can't break any sec restrictions, which means you can't entice investors, but outside of that, like, like what kind of real estate person uh, is easiest for you to help with where you are right now? So are you referring more to kind of in a partnership manner, so, uh, like yeah, general people, partnership type of manner? Yeah, yeah some people uh, are eager to speak to beginners. Other people are looking for uh, 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 people who who already own uh, some buildings. Uh, you know, there are there are a bunch of different uh, 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 types. You know, like maybe maybe you can help uh, contractors uh, start yeah. to uh, switch where where you help them as a repositioner and you give them an equity position just so that they don't cut corners or something like that. So like I've seen that there's lots of innovative ways that people have have uh, targeted particular uh, uh, types of real estate people and say it's like, OK, the more of you I can find, the better we'll all do uh, yeah. in business. So I think the person I am more um, positioned to help are the people that I'm, I'm actually is in my mission to help, which are underserved minority populations um, that financially have not normally been able to invest in these types of deals and syndications, either because the entry requirement of capital is way too high and we have not been able to um, sustain that as a community and i want to and that's called like if you're accredited investors i really am positioning myself to help unaccredited investors more so because i want them to get into deals i want them to learn how to build wealth and how to protect it and transition into maybe they not they don't become a family office type of wealth but they have enough wealth that they need to put estate planning in place and they need to put other protections and be able to live on cash flow now and also leave you know, equity and property and in assets for their future generations. So that's who I'm, you know, positioned to help the like unaccredited investor. 
Yeah, I, I love that. I love that because uh, the thing that kind of drives me crazy and not like, you know, like I'm upset all the time sort of drives me crazy, but it just seems like it's it's a raw deal. Uh, you know, if you go to a bank or something like that, the amount of returns that you're going to get, it, it's a joke. It doesn't even keep up with inflation. Yeah. And so uh, if an entire sector of society has the ability to accumulate wealth, to make it so that they don't have to be working 40 hours a week and they're not rolling that die that that says uh you know it's like oh well as soon as i have a health problem then you know like it's basically game over and i'm and you know like i'm going to be working jobs that i can't stand and i'm too tired to do for for my entire life it's it's a really really bleak prospect and that's why uh i i'm i'm really uh, uh, trying to, to find ways to make that work as well. I mentioned before, uh, and this is a side thing, 506 B me is something that you'll see uh, coming out, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the next little while to help people uh, access investors in a way that doesn't break the SEC rules. But um, uh, thanks for all of that. One thing that I want to mention to uh, you in the audience is that if you look very carefully below this video, somewhere below this hand right here, you'll probably see a big red button that says subscribe and that red is bad okay if it's gray then that's excellent okay and what that means is it means that youtube pays for these videos instead of me and that's what i really really like i like that google money i'm not so crazy about the alternative so please do hit subscribe on the video and then that way YouTube will pay for this and uh, it doesn't cost you anything as I mentioned and it just means that my videos might show up on your list of suggestions there's still no guarantee that that'll even happen but please do that because <laughs> it does make a big difference but but thanks again uh, Nicole for uh, for joining me today uh, the best way to uh, reach out to you we, we met through some meetups that I found through LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. is LinkedIn the best way to uh, reach you or is there a website that's better or something like that yeah, LinkedIn, Nicole Pendergrass at LinkedIn is fine. Um, also, you could go to my website, which is noirvestholdings.com, N-O-I-R-V-E-S-T, holdings, H-O-L-D-I-N-G-S.com. Um, and then all of my social media handles are there. You can send me a message through the website. You can sign up for my subscriber like investor list. So whenever I do have opportunities, I'm able to send them out to you because I cannot contact unaccredited investors if we do not already know each other. So that's the thing that a lot of unaccredited investors don't know. So if you want to invest in deals, you have to be on a subscriber list for other operators and be on a lot of subscriber lists so that you get multiple option deal options. Um, any deals you see publicly advertised, they're not for unaccredited. Sorry. But yeah, right. so that's why reach out to me, sign up for my list. Excellent. Excellent. So thanks again so much for this. It's been it's been really great, Nicole. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had fun. Awesome. I love that die too. <laughs> Sweet.